Okay. Welcome back, everybody, to our second lecture, second hour on uh, church and ministry administration. Are there any questions from anyone? So we went for the break and came back. Any questions? All right. Um, let's move forward. I'm just going to. Sharing, sharing the um, PDF. So what we've done so far is established a biblical perspective um, on you know, the fact that the, you know, God is a God of order and design, and he's put that in the work that he does on the earth. We also said there's a practical perspective People do expect the church to be organized, have good administration. Now, the, you know, um, like I mentioned in the very beginning, when we, have, when we talk about administration and organization, people will make some excuses, generally. And what are some of the excuses uh, we might en encounter? Some people say, oh, we don't have proper training. You know, we went to Bible college. They only taught us the Bible. Uh, they taught us scripture. They taught us the work of the spirit. They didn't teach us leadership and management and organization and administration. So we don't know how to do this, so we won't do it. Well, that's an excuse uh, which can be overcome. That means you can learn. You can learn how to, you know, have a, a proper organization how to put things together, how to plan, how to organize. So that can be learned. It's a skill that can be developed. Another excuse might be, uh, we don't have skilled people to do this, right? Or we don't have the means to hire skilled people. Well, maybe we can start off by engaging volunteers. Like we said, there could be people who are gifted by God in leadership and administration and helps. Uh, we just need to bring them together and give them the opportunity and start with what you have. You know, maybe you have two people who are willing to do it. Okay, start with them. And then from there, we, you know, as, as things grow, uh, God will provide and God will bring you in more skilled people. And maybe you'll even come to a time when you can hire uh, uh, skilled uh, people to help. Um, another excuse will be, well, you know, this is church and ministry must only be done by those trained in spiritual matters. We don't want the secular things to come into the church. You know, we, uh, we must, uh, and I'm just com com combining these two points, spiritual, personal, and, uh, you know, we must, uh, maintain, uh, uh, focus on spiritual things and, we don't want to get distracted by, you know, organization and so on. Well, like we said, even administrations, helps, leaderships, service, generosity, these are gifts and graces given by God. You know, so there are people who are given these gifts and graces and uh, they... Um, can serve in the church and they can help do things in the church. You know, so uh, it's not that we don't need these people. They are part of what God is doing. Um, another excuse could be, you know, we want to maintain a very spiritual atmosphere. We don't want any corporate, we don't have any organization. We don't want, you know, to have any rules and regulations and all that. Well, if you're going to be organized, you need to have things in place. You need to have certain guidance and things have to be done in a certain way we're not saying just because we are organized we are becoming like the world you know god himself is organized uh, so obviously it, it can show in in the church and uh, and uh, you know another excuse might be you know, this is god's work we don't need these kinds of human involvement well this is god's work but god is working through people right? he's working through us and 
And so we, we need to bring our best uh, to bear for the kingdom of God. So these are just some excuses. There could be others, you know, that people say, oh, we don't want to have organization. We don't be having good administration. Uh, but these excuses, you know, we can have a good response to them and hopefully convince people that uh, we need to have good administration. Let's go to lesson number two, which is um, what are the objectives of good administration? What are we trying to achieve? And what are we after uh, when we say church and ministry administration? Right? What are we trying to achieve? So uh, when we say uh, administration, we use the word administration. We are referring to all kinds of activities that actually support the spiritual ministry. So all kinds of things that support the spiritual ministry uh, can be classified as administration helps. Uh, and it's actually undergirding. It's helping us do the spiritual ministry well. Uh, whether it's to equip believers or share the gospel with those outside the church. Okay. So uh, let's begin by re-emphasizing re what we already said, that uh, administration is a spiritual ministry. No. Uh, in the context of the church, uh, it is... Uh, a God anointed minister, God appointed and God anointed. So we shouldn't think that administration is ah, uh, it's just meant for people who don't who don't have any level of spiritual interest. No, no, no. Administration is a God appointed and God anointed ministry. Like we read in First Corinthians 12, 28, God has appointed in the church. Helps administration. So it's a God appointed ministry. And we saw in Romans 12, God Himself has given grace. So it is a God anointed, God graced ministry. You know? So even if somebody's just doing helps, administration, organization, leadership, planning, financial management. These are not, you know, oh, let me put it this way. These are God appointed and God anointed ministers in the church. They may look very ordinary, but God has appointed them, God has anointed them to do that. Right? So it is a spiritual ministry in that sense that God is in it. And uh, the word, for ministry, the word for, uh, you know, when we look at the Greek words, yeah, uh, the word for servant in Romans. Let's go, let's read Romans 16. We haven't read that. Uh, that's interesting. It talks about uh, Phoebe, Romans 16. Let's read that. Romans 16, verses 1 and 2. Could somebody read it, please? Romans chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. I commend you to be as God, who is the servant of the church in St. Maria, that you may see her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. Okay. So I have to turn off that. Uh... The echo here on the volume. Okay. Thank you. So Romans 16, 1 and 2 is talking about Phoebe. And she's a servant, same word for deacon or minister. Right? And uh, 
and she yeah, Paul says, you know, receive her and you know, treat her in a, in, a, in a good way so that she can assist in whatever business she has need. You know, so she's just attending to some administrative thing, some business, he calls it. Right? So he's using the same word for deacon uh, for what Phoebe is doing. She's a deacon, she's a deaconess. She's doing some business, she's attending to some business. Um, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, the verse, verse we read earlier, helps. It means to assist uh, administrations. Uh, it means to steer a ship. And, uh, you know, it can be used for different kinds of leaders, whether in government or leaders or organizers. Uh, so that's the word administration. They're steering the ship. They are kind of guiding the ship in the way it should go. So it's quite a big responsibility, you know, taking care of the ship. But that's the word uh, administration that's used in 1 Corinthians uh, 12 28, which we read. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, 1 to 13, in there is, like we mentioned, there are bishops or spiritual leaders, but there are also deacons. The same word servant or deacon or a minister, uh, we see them. So, what I want to emphasize is that administration is a God-appointed and God-anointed ministry. Maybe you shouldn't look down on it. God has gifted these people, and he's put them in the church. So administration can be also looked at, and this is actually more from a you know general uh, management perspective, that, you know, generally they will they tend to debate, is it an art or is it a science, you know? But it is both. There is an art to it. You know, how do you organize? How do you see the right people in the right place and them working together? It's almost like an art. Like you know, how an artist would see the colors coming on their, you know, drawing and painting, and you know, it's almost like an art. But there is also a science to it. That means you can learn. You know, that this is how you do it. So art meaning uh, it is something uh, that there are traits and characteristics that can be developed and nurtured and uh, you can help people uh, there is this uh, art of understanding people of uh, you know being sensitive to people's needs and so on it's something that that's part of you and then there is a science to it that means you can develop the skills to organize to plan learn how to use the tools uh, to look at the finances, to budget things, um, to evaluate performance and analyze data. So that's a science to it. And then, there, like we said, there's a spiritual gifting that God anoints. So really in administration, we're bringing art and science and God's gift and we're bringing it all together. Right? That means God is giving us the anointing. He's giving us the empowering of the Holy Spirit. He's giving us ideas. He's giving us wisdom. But then also the, the, the innate abilities, the things that seem to come naturally to you, that's what we refer to as the art, artistic side of it. And then there is a the science side of it. That means you have developed certain skills, you've learned how to do certain things, and you bring it all together to carry out administration, serve the ministry, and so on. So it's nice to understand. And it's, all, it's a coming together of art, science, and the spiritual gift. Now, in, in this whole aspect of administration, uh, you know, uh, speaking about it in a very broad sense, there is the area of leadership, there is the area of management, and there is the area of administration. So in some courses, they would separate the two. They would say, okay, this is a course on leadership. This is a course on management. This is a course on administration, operations. Okay. Uh, now, what is the difference? When, we, when you look at the difference in, in these things, and you talk about leadership, you're talking about providing a vision, we have uh, direction, we're talking about strategy, we're talking about how to influence people and how do you align the organization towards achieving those goals. When you talk about management, we are breaking the whole big vision down into 
uh, you know, smaller units. How do you plan? How do you organize? How do you motivate people? How do you organize departments and so on? And the, the administration part, you're going down one more level of detail. You're looking at schedules, looking at how things are being executed. You're looking at um, accountability teams and performance and, uh, you know, costs and expenses and budgets and so on. Uh, so it's, it's, it's at different levels. Uh, leadership is at a much higher level, looking at bigger things. Management comes down a little closer to the actual day-to-day -day things. Administration is like, okay, get on the ground. How do you get things done on the ground? What's actually happening? How do you resolve the problems on the ground? So in this course, we are not going to differentiate things like, you know, so distinctly. We're going to kind of just overlap these things and talk about you know, all of these things in, 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 in a kind of a condensed way that okay, yeah. you, know, you provide vision, you organize, you manage, and you also uh, do the administration. Kind of combine all of them. Uh, you're not going to you know, distinct them, uh, break them out distinctly. So going back to our, uh, the main question in this chapter, what do we want to do? in good administration, especially in the context uh, of the church. Right? So this little diagram here helps, uh, helps us understand what we are trying to do. Right? Um, at the foundational level, we should be developing people, you know, recognizing who, the, you know, who are the people who can do these things, you know, putting the right people in the right place, uh, giving them the right opportunity and uh, the right support they need. So basically, it's building people. Because without people, you cannot have administration. Uh, we want to establish systems, uh, the way things work. Uh, we want to fine-tune processes so that they can keep improving better, keep improving. And then also, we want to allocate resources properly. You know, how we spend time and money and invest energies. So develop people, establish systems, fine-tune processes, make sure proper allocation of resources. So those are the overall high-level objectives we're trying to achieve in, the, in, in this whole administration of the local church. And this will then result in alignment to the vision, that means whatever is happening in the church, it should be aligned to the vision. You know, if there are 25 ministries, and if all 25 ministries are going in some different direction, people will be wondering, like, what is this church trying to do? Where is it trying to go? Right? There should be an alignment towards the vision. Every ministry is kind of moving the church in the same direction. Yeah, to become what we are supposed to become to achieve what we want to achieve, right? So there's got to be alignment of all the ministries. There may be a lot of ministries happening, but all ministries are moving in the same direction. Amos chapter 3, verse 3 says, can two walk together in agreement? Uh, two walk together unless they are in agreement, right? So if you look at it from the functioning of a ministry, can two ministries, you know, really work together and serve the purpose together unless they are in agreement. They have to be moving in uh, the same direction. Uh, of course, uh, the ministries must uh, be efficient. We don't want, uh, you know, if something can be done in a very simple way, uh, we don't want people to, you know, if something can be done in two steps, we don't want people to be doing it in 10 steps. Yeah, that's inefficient. So let's just bring it down to just two steps to get this done making it very efficient and there has to be it has to be productive it has to be resulting in fruit you know in john 15 even jesus says he's talking about being fruitful and he says you know you will bear much fruit and my father is glorified if you bear much fruit so uh, we want to ensure alignment efficiency and productivity so whatever is happening in the church they have to be moving the same direction. It has to be efficient. It has to be productive. So that's what we're trying to achieve. And the net result of it will be that 
all the ministry activities will help us move towards the goals and the overall vision of the church. What God has called us to do. We will be able to achieve that. So we have to develop people, establish systems, fine-tune processes, allocate resources so that there's alignment, efficiency, and productivity in it so that all the ministries can achieve the goals and vision of what we are called to do as a church. Okay? So that's the whole reason. Why are we having good, why do we want good organization and administration? This is it. We have to be accountable to God. We have to fulfill the vision that he has given us to fulfill as a church. Uh, we have to make good use of the people, the resources that he has given to us and bear the fruit he wants us to bear for his glory. That's the overall uh, objective of good administration. So in, in order to achieve that, obviously, uh, there are different skills that we need. We need people skills. Right? So we need to be able to take care of people. Uh, people are not machines. They just can't work endlessly. They have to be cared for. They have to be nurtured. They have to be developed. Uh, they have to be, you know, attended to if they are having problems. So we need people skills. We also need organizational skills. That means, you know, how can we put things together? How do we organize uh, systems, processes? How do we continuously review and uh, improve these things? So we need good organizational skills. And we also need technical skills, which is how do we allocate money, time, resources? How can we use tools, methodologies? And how can we measure the outputs? How can we check if things are going well? And how can we improve outcomes? So there is human skill, organizational skill, and execution skill that are required. Right? So hopefully, this course will help us understand some of these things and help us to well. Okay, let me pause here. Any questions from anybody so far? Everyone with me so far? Yes, Pastor. Okay. All right. So let's go to chapter three. Let me just introduce that. And uh, I will, yeah, let's go to chapter three. So the first thing is to form a legal entity. So, um, so he, we call it in, in India, we call it a trust, a church trust. Uh, in in the in the United States, it'll be called as a non-profit, a five hundred one c three non-profit organization. That means. Uh, that's typically what uh, a religious church would be uh, registered as, or a le the legal entity. So in different parts of the world, you know, they may use different language for this. But basically, we, the first step is to form a legal entity. Right? Now, why is that important? Because, first of all, uh, we want, in whatever we do, we want to submit to government authorities. Right? We don't say, oh, I'm a church, I can do whatever I want. And, you know, we, 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 don't, we don't try to make up our own laws, our own rules. No, we follow the rules of the land. Uh, so in India, uh, we have the provision for religious organizations to form uh, to be recognized as a legal entity uh, typically it's called a trust or a religious trust right? that's the kind of entity uh, that we form 
uh, in other parts of the world, it may be called by different names, but basically you are you're forming a legal entity that is recognized as a religious organization or a religious trust. Now, if somebody wants to do, you know, not just religious work, but social work, yeah, you can. You can form an entity that is recognized as a non-government organization uh, in order to do social work. Yeah, it may not be necessarily a religious organization. So however you want, but in our context, we're talking about a Christian church, we're talking about a Christian ministry. So generally it will come as a religious organization. So we want to be submitted to the government. Secondly, uh, we want to be blameless in how we conduct our ministry. So why are we forming a legal entity? so that everything can be done right, especially when it comes to handling money. You know, so Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, he says, you know, how, that, that the way we conduct ourselves, we conduct ourselves in a manner that is blameless. 2 Corinthians 6, we give no offense in anything, verse 3, we give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed, but in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God. So he says, you know, in the ministry, we don't want to do anything uh, that people can point fingers at us. So even in the way we do the church, uh, organize our ministry, uh, we want to be you know, blameless. We don't want people to find fault with us. Uh, another reason is we want to be honorable in the way we handle uh, everything, especially money. So in 2 Corinthians 8 and Paul, uh, verse 21, Paul says, you know, especially in talking about money, he says, we want to do honorable things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. That means uh, in handling money, we want to be right in the eyes of God and in the eyes of man. Right? So we can't say, hey, I'm just right in the eyes of God. Well, man is going to come and say, hey, show me your accounts. Where is the money going? What are you doing with the money? Are you paying your taxes? Are you doing things? Correct. Right? So... If we are not doing things correctly, and uh, you know we get into trouble, we can't call it persecution. You know, uh, and in India we've seen you know organizations that both you know Christian organizations as well as other non-governmental organizations, when they did not file their uh, their reports with the government, the government took action against them, and then they started saying, "Oh, government is persecuting us. No, government is not persecuting you. You didn't do what you're supposed to do." Right? You didn't file your uh, your reports with the government. So obviously, government is saying, hey, what are you doing? Right? You can't call it persecution. Uh, it's just that we have to do things right in the sight of God and man. Right? So we have to be accountable to uh, human authority, in which in this case would be the government. And of course, we want to have a clear conscience. You know, when, when, it, when we are doing things right, our conscience is clear. It gives us great boldness and authority to speak. Uh, we know that we're not doing anything wrong. Right? So forming a legal entity is very important. And uh, uh, so when and how should you do it? So when you're starting a ministry, um, whether a church or a Christian ministry, uh, there's an incubation period. That means you're kind of just launching the work you are um, uh, getting people together. Uh, you're getting things started. So as soon as possible, form the legal entity. Okay. So for example, for ABC, we had our first service in the month of February. We started, launched it. Now, at that time, we were not a legal entity, just like an informal thing. Oh, we are calling ourselves. All people search those who want to come, come. So 10, 12 people started. But we launched in February, but by April, we formed the legal entity. I mean, it's right in the very beginning, so within a couple of months. Right? And uh, so within a few months, we formed the legal entity so that from then on, we are official. Yes. We are, we are legally allowed to rent a space, open a bank account, 
uh, you know, we can collect, if we collect the money offerings from people, we can collect it and put it into that bank account. You know, they can have everything proper. So we started, and as soon as we, you know, found some people who can join us, uh, because you need, typically you need at least three or four people to form an entity. Uh, so we found it, you know, four, four of us were there. So we said, okay, with, and we were all aligned. We were all the same mind. We re registered as a religious trust. We formed a legal entity so that everything can be done properly. So while there will be a little period, incubation period, for you to kind of get things together, try to form a legal entity as soon as possible. Uh, you know, so I said, yeah, we recommend that you register a legal entity as soon as possible. Now, uh, uh, typically, you'll go to an accountant, a uh, chartered accountant, uh, and uh, they would refer to you, refer you to a, a lawyer. You know, who'll form the trust. I will give you a sample copy of uh, uh, our uh, our articles of, of of EBC. I'll give it to you next week uh, as an as a sample. So basically, you'll write down. Okay, this is what the objectives of this religious trust is. And uh, our approach was, as we were advised by our chartered accountant at that time, keep it as broad and as open. You know, that means in the future, you may not be doing all these things now, but in the future, if you want to get into any of these areas, you should be able to do it. Like if you want to start a Bible college, you want to start a school, you want to you know, do different things, just keep it open so that in the future, you can get into those kinds of uh, uh, activities. Right? So we had a trust. Uh, um, the, the articles that were written, and we registered that. So I will share that with you next week. But now I just want to emphasize, you know, the importance of forming a legal entity. And uh, we'll just get into this, right? So it gives you credibility. The fact that you are a religious trust, uh, a registered entity, uh, it gives you credibility. You know, when people are giving money, uh, they would prefer to give it in the name of the organization. If you say, yeah, give me money, give me all the money in my name, people have got a question, hey, how can I give money in his name, right? But when you say give it in the name of the church, you write your check in the name of all people's church or in the name of such and such ministry, then they know, okay, this money is going to go into that organization. And from there, it will be used. Uh, se secondly, a uh, uh, reason you want to form a legal entity is to have a separate status. You'll have bank account in the name of the organization. Uh, you can enter into legal contracts like rental agreements and all of that in the name of that organization. It doesn't have to be in your name. Okay? So everything is happening in the name of the organization, right? not, not in your personal name. Uh, it, of course, provides uh, protection. That means uh, it's keeping you know, your personal things separate from the organization. Right? So in, in a way, it protects the individual. It protects the directors, the office bearers. Their personal things are protected. Uh, if something goes wrong with the organization, it's not their personal things that are going to be affected. It's the organization that something went wrong here. So it's a very important thing to keep the separate, the liabilities are. Um, thirdly, uh, fourth, you can also enlist professional services. So when you want accountants, when you other people to work, they're working for the organization. They're not working for you personally. So they can handle things separately for it. And then there's also other benefits. Uh, you get tax exempt status. So uh, as a religious organization, uh, if you apply for tax exempt, uh, you know, for, in, for instance, in India, we don't have to pay taxes if we are registered as a religious trust. So they have a special provision. It's called 12A. So if you register as a 12A organization, then you don't pay tax on the income. You do pay tax on uh, all the services that you that, uh, for example, we, we pay tax, we collect the income tax of the individuals and we give that to the government. So that is there, but on the income, to, on, the, on the contributions to your organization, the government exempts you from paying tax on it. 
Uh, and so there are other benefits. And in some cases, you may even have access to public and private grants. Uh, they say, okay, nonprofits can apply for this. So if you're a nonprofit, you're registered, then you can apply for it and your organization can get uh, benefits. So there are a lot of benefits here of, of forming a legal entity. And so I would encourage, you know, as soon as you're ready to start your ministry and start your local church to form this legal entity. Right? And typically the entity can operate anywhere in the country. So although we are registered in Bangalore, India, we can operate anywhere in India. So we open up churches or do ministry or do work all across the country. You're given, you're, you have legal rights to operate anywhere within the country because you are a registered religious organization. Uh, and there are different kinds of organizations, religious, non-government, or education. Uh, in our context, we're talking mainly about the local church and so on. Okay. So, um, yeah, when, when do you form it? You know, uh, as, as soon as you can, once you've really got your work started, it's, you know, uh, and you understand what are the best options for what you're going to do. You have a core team because you need typically you need at least three people uh, to form. So you need three or four more people. You have enough money for the initial expenses, of course, to incorporate or to register. You, you have to pay uh, money to the uh, there are fees involved, whether the child accountant, the lawyer, and to register the entity, you have to pay those. So you have enough money to pay that. That's not much, but uh, you should have that money. Uh, you can get the help of a lawyer or a tax expert and accounting firm, and you review and finalize the articles of incorporation or what is known as a trustee. Then you can form the legal entity. All right. So um, I will stop here. What I will do is I will next week I will share with you the articles of incorporation or the trust deed of our church, uh, All People's Church, just as a sample. You, I'm not saying you should copy it. It's only an example, and you can keep it as a reference. And then uh, when you want to form your entity for your church or your ministry, you can take some ideas from there. And of course, you can get the help of uh, somebody local uh, to, you know, to, to make it better, to make it relevant to the kind of ministry you want to do. Right? So I'll share that with you. We can go over it and then I will we'll pick up from here. You know, how do you select those initial core people who are going to be the office bearers? They're going to be the the members or the trustees, the office bearers in the uh, in, in in your church or ministry. How do you select them? Uh, and just give some practical examples of uh, you know uh, what not to do and what to do. Uh, we will pick up from there. Okay, next week. Um, I hope uh, you're all with me. I hope you're not finding this boring. Okay, uh, but all these things are practical things that you have to do when you want to start a church or a ministry uh, these are the practical these are all the hard side to it you have to work through all these things you can't avoid it um, if you want to be uh, you know doing ministry in a good way without getting into trouble with the government right all right um, let's see now there's a question from Rosalind why some pastors don't deposit the entire offerings in the ministry account so Rosalind, that's a good question. And actually, the correct way to do it is all the money that we that you get as that you know a church gets as tithes and offerings should go into the bank account of the local church. Right? That's the right way. And from there, everybody gets. You know, all the staff, the pastor, and everybody else get a salary. That's the way the organization should function. So, and that's the way we've been functioning from the very beginning, right? That means all the money that people give in the offering goes straight 100% into the church account and it's recorded, right? And of course, these days, 
um, people uh, do online transfer. So it goes straight into the bank account. Um, of course, on Sundays, uh, there is a cash offering. And I will explain later when we come to the financial section how all of that should happen. Whatever we collect as cash offering on Sunday morning, uh, we have a group of people who will count it. So I'm not involved in that. You know, maybe I, like I said, in the very first <laughs> year, I had to sit and count. But uh, I don't do that. I've stopped doing it for you know a long time. Uh, there is a group of people who will sit, they will count, and they will write everything in a in a in a book and that full amount 100 percent goes into the church bank account right then so all the contribution whatever people give online everything goes straight into the bank account then at the end of the month everybody you know all the people who are staff in the church they get everybody gets a salary uh, based on their role and based on the work they are doing and the skills they have they get a fixed salary Okay. So it functions like an organization. That's the right way to do it. So if you say, you know, if we see some pastors or some people saying, uh, give me the cash or, you know, give it to my person. Like, and that's not a, that's not a right thing to do. Um, in fact, uh, you know, they're technically supposed to pay income tax on what comes in to their bank account, you know, and uh, there are a lot of complications and it's not right to do now, I hope I answered your question. Uh, yeah. Okay. So we'll get into those details on how to manage the church funds correctly. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's pause here for today. So next week, what I'll, uh, I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you uh, APC's uh, trustee. Just uh, they won't read the whole thing because it's many pages, but I'll just quickly take you through like see, this is what you should put into a trustee. Uh, very important because whatever you write in the articles of incorporation is going to almost like be a rule. It can be modified later, but that's a you have to go through a process. So it's best that you get it right in the beginning. Whatever you put in the trustee and the articles of incorporation. It's going to regulate the activities of the ministry. So it's very important that you check it very carefully. And uh, before you register that document with the government, uh, because the government can hold you accountable to that. You know, basically you're saying, this is what we're going to do. Right? This is what, you know, we call it all people's church. You can call it whatever name. And you register with the government. You're saying this is what this organization is going to do. The government will hold you accountable for that. Right? So we'll go through it next week and then I'll we'll take this forward. Could somebody please pray and then we will close? Anyone can pray? Thank you for this day. Thank you for the class that we had. Oh, we thank you that you're a God who equips us. You're a God of order, design. And God, you have called us, uh, you have chosen, and you're a God who fills us with wisdom, Jesus. Right now, as we are listening to the classes on how to uh, administer a church, a ministry, or anything that we do, God, we give ourselves into your hands, Jesus. We give our life, uh, we give our minds, uh, fill us with your plans, fill us with your vision, fill us with your goals, and uh, give us the wisdom. Those who lack wisdom can ask you, the God who gives us generosity. As we are listening to other classes, help us to open our mind and heart and listen to it and help us to be accountable to you and as well as in the sight of men. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Um, see you all again next week. God bless you. Have a good week. Thanks.